the Lord be with you. And also with you. Well, so it is uh, the 4th of July, and so we are being festive, and we should be. Um, I had asked everybody to do the best they could to look festive, and uh, so let's let's vote real quick. Who do you think is the most festive-looking person in the church? Ron, thank you. Ron. 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 Okay, Ron, you have to stand up. It's okay for you to put your hat on for a minute. There you go. I should have had you come up here so you could be on the camera, but uh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> The, uh, the only thing really in announcements that I have today is that uh, you remember last week I mentioned that this person that was in the intensive care unit up here at what used to be called Bayshore, it's now Southeast, HCA Southeast. Uh, Kelly reported to me yesterday that they've taken her off the ventilator and most of her meds. She's not going to lose her foot. Oh. And uh, so Kelly's going to bring a card next week that we can all sign. She doesn't know who we are, but that doesn't matter. And uh, it is absolutely true that prayer works. And uh, so we have a couple of examples of that. Brother McKinney up here is feeling better. And, uh, and I think, that, you know, it's, of course it's the medicine, but it's also, uh, I think the medicine is a gift from God as well. And so we want to continue to pray. It's good to see everybody here. If I didn't get around to shake your hand, I will do it in a little while. Um, the, we are... We're not going to have Bill Nash here for the summer concert like we usually do. Their camp actually starts today. I think I mentioned to you that they got a deal. Uh, we quit having camp on 4th of July weekend at Lakeview because of the conflicts. It was a long weekend and parents were off with their kids and stuff. But Bill was able to get a better deal on the camp price. And so they're having camp. But I talked to Kim and uh, they don't really pay a lot of the bills for camp until after camp anyway. And so we are in the process of taking any our communion offering today, any money that's been in the bucket for the last few weeks. And uh, and then the, I know the, the men's Bible study has some funds they're going to put in there. And uh, and then some individuals are making uh, sponsorships. So we're going to stop that at the board meeting on July the 13th. And then we'll be that'll be the, the day that we cut it off and we figure out how much we have and we send it to the Champions Kids Camp. Uh, they are extremely grateful for our continued participation, and they will be here. They haven't been able to do any of their fundraising kind of concerts uh, because of COVID, and so uh, we want them to come when it can be fun. Uh, they'll still be able to talk about Champions Kids Camp, but it'll be much more of a party uh, the next time they come. We'll try to arrange it so they're not in a hurry, and maybe we'll do a Sunday afternoon so they can come and, and uh, you know, we can have hot dogs or something. But uh, let's, uh, we'll, we'll work that out as time permits. Um, I don't think I have any other announcements. Women's uh, Bible study. Oh, women's Bible study is going to begin on Tuesday, July the 13th at 9.30. And it'll, for right now, it'll be here in the sanctuary at the tables in the back. Yes, Susan? Pantries. Well, yeah, the pantry's pretty empty. It's fair. Uh, <laughs> there was a guy came in last night for church, was sitting on the couch out there. And, uh, I said, you want to come on in to worship? He said, no, I want to eat. <laughs> and uh, so I directed him down there to what meager stuff we had. I told him to take some food. But we do need to concentrate on bringing some canned goods and stuff up here for the pantry. Uh, it's, you know, it's just one of those things. It, it ebbs and flows. Right now it's ebbed, and we need to flow it again. So when, you, when you're at the grocery store, and uh, it's like somebody said last night, ramen noodles are, you know, five for a dollar. And uh, it doesn't have to be... We're not worried about whether it's it's just food. This guy said he hadn't eaten in four days, uh -huh. and uh, so that's that's a service that we provide. That uh, there's a lot of homeless people right now, and uh, it, it's uh, we're, we we really don't realize how blessed we are. So today we're going to be singing some patriotic songs. Uh, we're going to start with America, and uh, my suggestion would be that you stand as we sing. And uh, yeah, one more. Oh yeah, so oh, the mission store is also donating for Champions Kids Camp, and so you'll see a red tablecloth in the back. Where this is Christmas in July. Um, we in the past we have sometimes not put our Christmas things out until right before Christmas, but uh, this is and already it's getting some interest. Uh, we we had a pretty big sale last night, so uh, keep in mind that that stuff is back there. What we have, we also need new things. Uh, we will be having an auction in September. 
and we will uh, so it's okay for if you have stuff you can bring it and the people running the mission store they'll decide whether it's auction or we put it out here now or we hold it for a while um, and you know if you're in doubt bring it and we can uh, we can take care of staging it where it needs to be uh, if you're cleaning out stuff you know we're not interested in clothes uh, but other than that, you know, we people are, if it's good and usable, uh, I think people are taking a look at it. I, uh, there's a good couple of good sets of dishes back there right now. So uh, just, you know, be aware of that. We've, we've kind of moved it into here for a while. I don't know that we'll keep it in here all the time, but it hasn't been distracting or anything. It gives you something to look at while you're waiting for church to start. So uh, we're working on that. It seems to me that no matter where the back row is, it's going to be full. So I'm thinking about having the back row be on the front. <laughs> just, yeah, we'll just name the front row the back row, and then we'll see if it changes anything. But <laughs> anyway, so that would mean all of y'all in the back are sitting on the front row. Or oh, whatever. Um, we'll, we'll talk more in a little bit. Um, let's prepare our hearts and minds for, well, let's just sing America. We don't need to do that other stuff. If you're, if you're able to, willing and able, let's stand, let's sing. sixth chapter beginning with the second verse on the sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astounded they said where did this man get all of this what is this wisdom that has been given to him what deeds of power are being done by his hands is not this the carpenter son of mary and brother of james and Joses and judas and simon and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no need of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went around among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their hand, belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with all many who were sick and cured them. This is the word of the Lord. Thank Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. So it is Communion Sunday this week, the first Sunday of the month, always on our Sunday service. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we do Communion every Saturday night. 
And the only requirement we have in the United Methodist Church is that you answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites us to His table, all that love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, those things done and left undone, our actions without love, our reactions without thought, our failure to forgive, hurtful words said, helpful words unsaid, tasks unfinished and hopes unfulfilled. God of generosity, forgive us to lay down our burdens of regret. Friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, we're a forgiven people. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Johnny, turn me down just a smidge. Our second scripture this morning comes from 2 Corinthians. It's in the 12th chapter, way back in the back of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul says to us these words, I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that were not, that are not to be told. That no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on all, my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardness, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I'm weak, then I'm strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is, this is almost sounds silly. But this is my first Sunday of a new church year. Uh, today, I celebrate the beginning of my 13th year at this church. Maybe y'all celebrate that too, I don't know. But uh, the interesting thing about that is my buddies all around, there's a new preacher this year over at Deer Park, and there's a new preacher down at Bay Harbor. These are all friends of mine. People from Deer Park have been calling me and saying, do you know John? I said, yeah, I know John. They said, what do you think about him? He's really tall. <laughs> I'm not going to give them any input. They'll figure it out on their own. One of the ones down at Bay Harbor is an old seminary buddy of mine. And so we, we, we all have these times when it's a first. But for me, it's different to be coming to you and not have to preach a first Sunday sermon. Way back on June the 8th, 2008, was my first Sunday here. We still had stained glass windows over here. And I recall somebody had been telling me over and over about Golden Acres Methodist Church, that we have a really good small church. And I, I want to tell you, there's nothing small about the body of Christ. And if we start thinking little, we'll be little. And one of the things that I think has happened to the church is that we're lackadaisical or bored or we're not exciting. Um, it's almost like having a job that you, you know you have to go to, but you really don't like it that much, but you don't like it, you don't dislike it enough not to go. And so I began to think about what we could do different, how we could be different in church and what would differentiate us. Years ago, we did a thing called Church Unique. And one of the things we decided in that group was that we would do what we do better than 10,000 other churches. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to compete with them. We can't compete with some of the big churches in town as far as the kind of Bible school they do or the other things. We just don't have the resource to do that. But we can be what we are better 
than anybody else. Now, we, like Paul, have a couple of thorns, right? And sometimes, and I'm not talking about the people, sometimes things don't go right. Sometimes we have to overcome things. We have, it took 10 years to overcome redoing the sanctuary. It took another 11 years to get the roof fixed. I mean, those things, they don't happen all at once. And even though we do have some old building thorns, we also don't have any debt. And so when you, you go through this, this is what, what Paul reminds us, no matter what your circumstances, no matter how bad you think it is, His grace, God's grace, is sufficient to get you through it. So I began to think about that, and I have a, a years ago, I used to work at Ocarina Springs in San Marcos. I was a glass bottom bunk driver. I still remember most of the pitch. You know, I would start off and say, Welcome to Ocarina Springs. My name's Jack. I'll be your skipper for today. I'm not your captain. Because captains go down with their ship. <laughs> the guy, and you got it. It got there. Yeah. The uh, the guy that was the president of Operating Springs name was Mr. Phillips, and Mr. Russell had started it, and Mr. Phillips was the was the president. His son Bob worked with us, and Bob and I were not that good of friends, but we were working at the same place at the same time. And a few years ago, when Ocarina Springs was bought out by or closed, and then the, the school bought it as a nature preserve, Bob called me up and asked me if I would be a part of a documentary that he was doing on the on the history of Ocarina Springs. And so I was the, the boat driver that got to tell the story about the things that we did there. It was it was great, and there was a, a certain amount of enthusiasm. On days like the Fourth of July, when we were open, we would run something like 50 boat rides each taking those people out and back it was a very busy time anyway so I, I was inquiring with Bob what he does for a living and he said well I teach fish philosophy you might know what fish philosophy is I'm not talking about fish stories because they're not true or sometimes they're not so I went and went to the, the trouble to go ahead and purchase this book called fish and, uh, and it's like so many other things that happen in life. It says on the front, read, apply, and repeat. In other words, it's not a very big book, but we've got to keep doing what it says. And so the story, the fish story is, I'll, I'll make it shorter than reading the book for you, is there's a, a woman that her and her husband moved to Seattle. He has a nice job. She has a nice job. They've been there only a short time, and he died. And so she had two children and a house and all the other things they had to do. And so when the boss came to her and said, I'd like to give you a promotion up to the third floor, she wanted the job because it paid more, but she didn't want the job because everybody hated the third floor. Now this was like a financial institution and the third floor was the back office stuff. Their, their customers were their own people. You know, it's kind of like when you deal with maintenance or wherever you do, wherever you work. It's the people, it was an internal structure, and everybody hated them. And she went up there, and she discovered everybody was right. It was a toxic workforce. In fact, it was named a toxic dump. And everybody up there had their own problems, right? There were other single moms. There were other people that were sick. There were other people with sick children. Whatever the story was, everybody had something. And they were just showing up for work, doing their job. They were never early. They never stayed late. And sometimes they didn't even answer the phone when the people downstairs called. Nobody wanted to deal with the third floor. Well, after about a week or so, she started having to leave for lunch to get away from it. And so she, one day, just out on a whim, she turned and went down to the, the what's, it's called the Pikes Peak Fish Market in Seattle, Washington. Yeah. yeah, you ought to look it up on Facebook or somewhere. It's there. And she witnessed, you know what a fish market looks like, right? We don't see that many of them nowadays, but you know, they got big old fish in buckets of, of, of ice. And it's not a really cool job. And the people working there are going back to the freezer and bringing fish and putting them there and wrapping up fish and you know fish smell like fish these guys are wearing rubber boots they got on aprons and they're having to do this job because that's how they make a living but this particular fish market has droves of people going just to watch and the reason they go watch is because the the mongols they call them the fish guys 
They're getting a big old salmon over here and there'll be a row of people here and another one of his buddies on the other side of the island. He'll heave it over them. And when the other guy catches it, he'll open it and open his mouth like it's talking to the people. <laughs> These guys found a way to take a horrible, really a horrible job and make it fun. And because they made it fun, people now go there just to see the fun. And she was amazed. And she said, if they can take a job like that and make it into something fun that people want to go to, maybe there's hope for what we need to do. Now I want to tell you, there's been a lot of people say, I'll be glad when the pandemic's over so church can go back to normal. Well, let's be real. Church hadn't been doing good for a long time. Attendance is down, and I'm not talking about our church, at churches. Church attendance is down, participation is low, people are not that excited. We're certainly not uh, joyful, even though sometimes if I ask you, you can say it, right? How are you today? Joyful. Uh, yeah. But we're that's about the only time we really get joyful. I've said it before, sometimes we're like the frozen chosen. And I, my concern is that we're really just kind of stagnant. We're, we're coming to church because we want to come to church. We need to come to church. We think it's important to come to church. But what are we doing with coming to church? So this little book has really four things that I think we could work on. You know, years ago, Bishop Huey gave us things like radical hospitality and extravagant generosity. And... The first thing this person says, and I think this is the first thing we need to work on, is the only person that can control your attitude, that decides what your attitude is going to be today, is you. Amen. Period. Now what she found in this workplace was that nobody had a good attitude. But somebody, not her, put a big sign on the door that said, choose your attitude, and had a smiley face and a frowny face. And people started to do that when they'd come in. And you could at least identify who the frowny faces were. I want to tell you, if you're coming to God's house, it ought to be a smiley face. And we need, if we've got issues that are going on that keep us from having smiley faces, then we need to work on those. But we need to have an attitude of gratitude when we walk into this place because God has provided it for us. Amen. And we have a place to come. And that's exactly, Paul's right, there's some thorns. We got stuff going on in our lives. My arm hurts. I'm going through therapy for that. I've got things to gripe about. You probably do too. But you know what? My attitude, if it's good, will get past those things. I can get through it. We were talking earlier, Johnny's treatment and, and other people that are going through treatments. People that have a good attitude about it do better. Attitude is everything. Yeah. But then it's not everything. What they discovered at the fish market was they had to play. Now, I think we need to work on that, too. That's the reason I wore my silly hat today, and I'm not wearing my robe, is I've got a, a task for you. I think in the future days, starting tomorrow or next week, we ought to work on this. If you've got a good joke that's clean that we can tell in church, you ought to bring it with you. If you don't want to get up and tell it, that's okay. Write it down, I'll tell it. If you want to tell it, we'll let you stand up and tell it. But we need to share that. And when you do, you probably need to stand up. And, and, and I'm going to pick on Harry because I can see him right there. You know, hi, I'm Harry Jenkins. I live down the street from here. I came to this church to get married many, many years ago. I came back some time ago. And here's my joke. Because the truth is, you don't get to know each other just sitting in church. The old days of having half the people that came to church sitting in Sunday school i got to tell you, I think those days are, are, are past. we got to find new ways. We, we can't focus on what we've always done and try to make it work. we got to find something new. And I want to tell you, if you guys start having fun in worship, not just hearing a good message, which I hope you hear, not just hearing from the gospel, not just singing some beautiful music, but if you start having fun, I'm thinking you'll be smiling when you leave with an attitude that just might be contagious on somebody you run into when you go to eat or go somewhere else. Make a little bit of sense? I think we need to have fun. I think fun is really important. Now, just like at this company, they still needed to do their work, and we're still going to hear good gospel messages, and we're still going to respond to the Word of God, but I believe God will smile if we do it with a smile. And I think it can change things. It won't change everything. The next thing they work on is... is uh, being really present. And this is a place that we do pretty good here, but we need to work at it a little bit more. 
You know what it means to be present? You know, we promised that, right? When we join the church, I'll be there with my prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Let me tell you, most of you, if, if I ask you how you are, you're going to tell me fine. But you might not be fine. And you really don't think I care. Because if you thought I cared, you'd tell me. That's what Paul's talking about in the scripture when he says, my grace is sufficient in spite of my troubles. I'm here to be a minister of the gospel to you. And sometimes we need to listen. Now, maybe it won't work. Maybe there's not going to be time during worship. So you meet somebody and you come in and they say, yeah, you know, I've had a bad week. What would be wrong instead of rushing out of here to go to the restaurant and say, look, let me visit with you for 10 minutes after church. In other words, we need to really be present for people. Now, we know that's true with little children. You can watch people that teach kids. If you're teaching a little child, you get on your knees so you can be eye to eye with them. But in today's world, if you're not careful, the person you're talking to is going to be listening to you and looking at their phone. That's the world we live in today. So what I'm saying to you is if you want to be present for somebody, if you want to ask them how they are, then really care how they are. Look them in the eye, and I promise you they will answer you differently than if you just casually go up there and say, hey, good morning, how you doing? I think people want to be cared about. Don't you? Amen. Now, I know Johnny will tell you he appreciates the prayers. But I'm going to tell you, there's probably five other people in here right now that need prayers too that we don't know. They haven't told us. They don't feel comfortable sharing. So this present thing is really a big deal. And then the other thing that they did, that the fish market did, and, and this has worked for us too, I think, is they started to worry about making somebody else's day not theirs. So when they put on their performance at the fish market, they're getting their work done playfully, but they're also got people around there with a cup of yogurt cheering every time the guy doesn't drop the fish on the other side. They've got a party going on. I gotta tell you friends, the community we live in right now, and I would say that's all of Southeast Harris County, desperately needs to hear that Jesus is Lord. They desperately need to hear that Jesus is king. They need to hear something besides a political, focused, one way, what's in it for me message. It isn't anything in it for us. We already have salvation promised to us. It's what's in it for them. So I haven't really fully developed all the things we're going to do with this except for the joke telling part. But I think that, that one of the things we can do when we listen to what Paul says in this scripture, he says, three times I prayed for the thorn to get away. In other words, what he was saying, three times I went to God and said, oh my God, things aren't going well. And then he decided to change that and have an attitude of gratitude. He said, in spite of all of those persecutions, I'm going to still be a blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I believe that applies to us. What do you think? And I think we've got to get serious, playfully, about how we make that work out. My vision is that if we get this figured out and we start to have some fun, and people hear about us having fun in church and, and also getting a good message and being oriented toward Christ, that people are going to say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Somebody's telling jokes in church? Somebody's having fun, they're smiling, they're having a good time? Well, that'll be really un-Methodist, let me tell you. <laughs> We think we have to sit there and uh, frown. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, we do. And, and I, I'm right there with you. I grew up, I learned how to sit still in church, never make a motion, never do anything. Mrs. Easton, all the years that she came to church here, she said, Preacher, sometimes I just want to raise my hand and say hallelujah. What would happen if that happened in our church? <laughs> I think if you feel it, you ought to be able to be it. And so this is not just something we talk about and do. This is something about what we become. Who are we really? When we say we're the heart and hands and feet of Jesus Christ, are we really? Are we paying attention? Do we know what's going on down the pew from you? Who's sitting down from you? The troubles they have? What's going on in their life? Do we know how maybe there's something the church or we can do to help? Well, we do know is that there's a whole bunch of people showing up at that food box out there. That's something we can do. 
We don't have to know them, but if we see them out there, what's wrong with them? I talked to the guy yesterday. I told him, I said, pal, I, you're welcome to come into church if you want. And he said, well, I really haven't eaten in four days. I said, well, go down there and let's get you some food. And he sat there on the bench and ate. But at least he, I don't know his name. That's my bad. I should have asked him. But at least he had an idea that somebody here cared more than just say, I'm sorry. And there's nothing we can do. If we want to be the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we want to be the Christians that we claim to be, then we need to be present in the world out there as the body of Christ. And that means we've got to sometimes uh, zip it and not say what we think. Sometimes it means we've got to listen more than we talk. My third grade school teacher used to remind us of that all the time. She said, you got two, ear, two ears and one tongue. Use them in that order. I think there's, there's some significant things that we can do to make differences and to change. And I think the other thing is to believe that God is big enough to actually do something with all of us. That God can actually take this church and make it become something nobody expects it to be. Now, I'm not dissatisfied with the last 12 years. We've come a long way, baby. But I think we've got somewhere further to go and something different to do, and we don't have to go by anything we used to do. It's time to change the rules. Now, I got some we have to go by. The Methodist Church gives me some rules that we have to follow. But we can be creative about how we do some of that. You know, we have to have board meetings. You know, we got to report the income we get and all that other kind of stuff. We have to do that. But we can sure as heck be creative about the way we do ministry. Pretty soon, won't be it'll be pretty be here pretty quick. We're going to have pumpkins showing up out in the front. I don't expect this year's pumpkins to be anything like we've ever done in the past. I expect us to find a way to almost do like the fish guys and make it fun. I'm not talking about fun for the people who come. I'm talking about fun for us. We need to have fun doing the ministry we do here at the church. Friends, I want to tell you, when you got up in the morning and you decide whether you're going or not, if it's a humdrum, boring thing you've got to go to, as often as not, you can make the decision not to go. So if we decide up front that we're going to make our attitude be an attitude of gratitude, in other words, we're going to choose our own attitude every day. How many of you think that would make a difference for you? Do you realize you've always had that choice? Always you've had that choice. I want to tell you, you now have permission to do it. Choose your attitude. Sometimes you're not going to feel good. You know, Bishop Jones told us when he told the whole thing about joyful, he said, he said people say, Bishop, how are you? And he said, I always answer joyful. He said, sometimes I'm not. But I found that if I can start there, my day improves. When I ask you, how are you? And you say joyful, I can tell you the smiles come on your faces. It's almost impossible to say I'm joyful with a frown on your face. So what you need to do is decide when you get out of the car or when you get into the car at home, Today, and this is every day, I'm going to have an attitude that makes me somebody that somebody wants to be around. Now, I promise you, that'll improve your marriage. It'll improve your relationship with your children. It'll improve your relationship with your neighbors. They're not going to all respond. But we have a choice on how we do. I think it's also okay for us to remember that we can be somewhat playful. A little bit of horsing around is not a bad thing. And I, I just think that you know, years ago I went to, to a meeting. Uh, a guy by the name of Doug Padgett is the pastor of Solomon's Park Porch up in, I think it's in Minnesota. And he said, how many of you preachers tell people at the beginning of service, turn off their cell phone? A whole bunch of them raise their hand. He said, quit doing that. What do you mean? It might ring. Yeah, it might. And some of you got some pretty cool music when it rings, right? He said, but you never know. Sometimes something happens that somebody really does need to reach somebody about. And sometimes that something is somebody just had a car wreck or a heart attack or something else. And if it happens while we're in the church, look who we've got. We've got a cloud of witnesses to pray. Let's don't be afraid of what the world brings to us. Let's take something different to the world. I don't care if you turn your cell phone off. If it rings, turn it, you know, answer it. 
It doesn't, it doesn't bother me one way or the other. I think some of this stuff about let's make sure we don't do anything to rattle the cage while we're in church today is just absurd. Y'all remember Oral Roberts in the old days? Y'all probably don't know this, but Oral Roberts was a Methodist. Went to Boston Avenue United Methodist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He never, ever did his evangelism stuff on Sunday. But do you remember how he started his TV show? He said, expect a miracle. That's the kind of attitude I want you to have. Expect a miracle. Maybe a miracle will happen. I've seen one take place with this young lady up at the hospital. I've seen it. Because people are praying. One of the nurses took a radio, put it on Christian music. Other people have been praying. The word has spread. People, that's the person named Candace, doesn't even know about are praying for her. And she's getting better. And I'm feeling pretty good about it too. Because what the last thing was, make it about them, I'm making it about her. So many times we forget we live in the greatest country in the world. You know, let's face it, it is a great country. And we are blessed beyond comparison. We've got more, our poorest people are richer than some. We've got a lot of things going for us. Now we can get on a griping cycle about it, can't we? But what if we first start to give thanks that we have what we have? Yeah. God's grace is sufficient. No matter what happens in the government. God's grace is sufficient no matter what our thorns are. Don't focus on your thorns. Focus on God's grace. It'll improve your attitude. I promise. Well, I'll tell one more story about Oral Roberts. My friend Muzan Biggs was the pastor at Boston Avenue. I called him up one time because I was missing him. And I said, Dr. Biggs, how's it going? He said, Jack, I really can't talk right now. i got to go up to the hospital. Mr. Roberts is in the hospital, Oral Roberts. And he said, you know, i got to tell you, this has been a trouble for some of our preachers at this church because he's so prominent. I mean, he's got Oral Roberts University, and, you know, he had the TV show and all that other stuff. And he's, some of our preachers go up there, and they go in, and he's sick, and he's in the bed, and the first thing they say is, Oral, would you pray for me? You get that? Mm. Preachers aren't perfect. We make mistakes. We don't always reach out the ways we should. But I want to tell you, praying for others is the very best thing you can do if you want to improve yourself. And I think that's what the fish market proves to us. They began to take, a, they call them fish mongrels, they began to take a menial, kind of mean, awful, nasty, dirty task, and they made it into a production that was fun. I don't know about y'all, but I, don't, I like to go to places where I have fun. I went to the zoo the other day. I had fun. I'm going to go back. If I go, to, I used to go to, the, uh, to a different play over here in Deer Park. I didn't have fun. I'm not going back. If you have fun, you're going to go back. And I think sometimes that doesn't dilute the gospel message, but I think that's, if you want to know what I'm thinking as I look into year 13, I'm saying, okay, we've got a foundation built. We've got nice chairs in the sanctuary. We've got some stuff going on. The air conditioners all work. The roof's fixed. Now, what are we going to do? Well, one day at a time, we're going to clean this building up, empty out the trash out of the rooms, get stuff cleaned up. And in the meanwhile, we're going to try to have fun be in the church. I believe that can change the world. And maybe we can be the beginning of that change. Um, I thought about just buying everybody a copy of this book. I didn't do that. But I am going to work through it again and again, different ways that we can fit it. It just was coincidental, or maybe it was God, that today is the scripture where Paul says, I got a thorn I can't get rid of, and I got to go do ministry anyway. And I'm going to do it with an attitude of gratitude. Thankful for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what he says when he says, I'm not going to boast, but I could. And if I do it, I wouldn't be a fool because I'd be boasted in the name of Jesus Christ. It is not about any one of us here or Hope Community United Methodist Church's survival. It's about the eternity that we offer to those people that are out there. And as soon as we can get focused on that, I don't expect this to, to transform the church tomorrow. 
But I do expect us to begin to have conversations about what it means, how it works, what can we do different, what can we do. Suggestions are welcome. Probably not during the middle of a sermon because you'll get me distracted, but I'm welcome. to. We can sit down, we can have groups, and, and the first place we're going to talk about it will be at the board meeting on the 13th. Uh, so it's at 6.30 that night. If you want to talk about it some more, come and be there. I'm excited to be back. I, I uh, One of the few preachers that hadn't had to move a lot, and I'm excited to be here again. And I'm and just I'm telling you, this isn't my swan song. This isn't the last year and then I leave. I'm not expecting to go right away. But I do think that, that we need to identify ourselves as something better than 10,000 other churches. And we need to work toward that. And as we do and when we do, I think some of our folk, they're getting less scared of COVID. They're getting their, vac their vaccines and so forth. They're coming back or we're doing better every day. But that doesn't, we're, I can tell you, it's easier to get a new person than it is to get somebody that's mad to come back. There's lots of people out there that don't know Jesus. And they don't think coming to church can be fun. The first thing you need to tell them, this is what gets asked me all the time, do I have to wear a suit? What's the answer at Hope? No. no. What if the only thing you have is blue jeans? It's okay. That's okay. God doesn't care and we don't either. What if you want to drink coffee in the sanctuary here? That's okay. That's okay, isn't it? You know, that, that, let me tell you, that doesn't happen everywhere. What if you like to sit at a table instead of a chair? That's okay. Works out. We've got stuff going on. So I want to tell you, that's what I'm talking about when I said, let's lighten up a little bit. Let's be what this community needs us to be. The last thing I'll say about that is just a reminder that Michael Slaughter went to Ginghamsburg uh, Church oh, uh, 40 years ago, and there were 26 people there. And they did, they were older, and they all did what old people all do. Said, oh, preacher, we want to get, and he was young. He said, because you're here, maybe we'll get some young people. He said, yeah, he said, that'd be nice, but uh, y'all aren't going to have any babies. And uh, it's probably not going to happen. What can we do that our community needs? It was a very poor community. And they started a thrift store. Well, let me tell you, this morning at Ginghamsburg Church, they'll have 5,000 people in worship. Because they started to meet the needs of the community, not ask the community to meet their needs. They got young people now, too. They got all kind of people. It was a very interesting community outside of Dayton, a ways that... that Really, the church, the Methodist church, had little hope for him. Well, Michael Slaughter went there and he said this. He said this to me personally. He said, when you preach to the congregation, you've got to preach change. We can't be what we used to be. We can't be what we are. We've got to be what God wants us to be. And he said, after you preach that message, preach change some more. And I think that's exactly why I got involved with the fish philosophy because it doesn't come from church growth people. It comes from people that are going out and taking people's morale and improving it. And I've got to tell you, I think our morale here is good, but it can be better. I think we can be joyful about the work we do, the ministries we do, and the way we serve. We got to see that. Today, none of our campers are here, but if you could see Brent, Melissa, and Ginger at camp, you'd see them that way. I want that same kind of enthusiasm here. I told Ann today, I said, whatever you want to play when we come to communion, lighten things up. We don't have those rules. You know, they give me a lot of latitude in the Methodist Church. We don't, I don't have to play some somber. We are going to sing all the verses when we sing, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we, can, we can do the stuff we have to do, but we can also have fun. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. That's where I'm headed. I just felt like today was the day I should go into that because what are we going to do now? I have almost no preacher friends that have been anywhere 13 years. So they all have a first sermon they preach the first time they go to a new church. The only first part of my first sermon I'll tell you is that we need to be more focused on the people outside that window than we are. And we got to realize that the people outside that window will come here if they're going to get some value from it. And that value is, of course, the Word of God, and it's also the friendship and the collegiality that comes from a congregation. My friend Ray, sitting in the back back there, said last week he, what, he didn't get to church. I'm not going to tell you why. But he tuned in and watched it on Facebook. 
And his observation was, it was pretty good, but it's not like being here. Isn't that right, Ray? It's not the same as being here. And so we need to tell people, yeah, watch it on the online. If you need to do that two or three weeks before you come, check that out. But come and see what it's like to be here. Amen. And I think it's the beginning of what I predict can be our best year ever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're going to uh, we're going we're gonna to do this. We can do this now, uh, friends. We're, this is going to be kind of short, though. Don't do it too long because you'll be late and then you'll be mad at the preacher. Uh, as you're able, would you please stand? Uh, take this opportunity just to briefly look around, shake hands, check on somebody, and offer the signs of peace and reconciliation. Take care, dear. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe. For with your eternal word and Holy Spirit, you're forever one God. 
Through your word, you created all things and called them good. And in you, we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke through your prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And you may be seated. Holy are you and blessed is Jesus Christ who called you out of a father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own and fill them with a longing for a peace that would last and for a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night... Before meeting with death, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you and broke the bread. Gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ is dying. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine we may know the presence of of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world redeemed by Christ's blood. As the grain and the grapes once dispersed in the fields are now united on the table in bread and wine, so may we and all your people be gathered from every time and place into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God now and forever and the church said amen so friends if you haven't been here for a while we're still doing communion this way when you come up you'll get bread in a little cup like this grape juice in a little cup like this i'll put them down here for you and you can then dispense with the plastic receptacles in the trash right below you uh, the table is prepared come to this place we're having another meeting
Friends, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. God is calling. I believe smiling and joyfully for us to go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. I want to remind us all as we come to this place, as you leave this place, we are forgiven people. Now let's go forth and change the world. Amen? Amen. As you're able, would you stand as we close out our service today? We're going to sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. You know we don't pass an offering plate right now because of COVID. There's a basket in the back. We gladly accept your gifts, tithes, and offerings. Let's sing together. So the Lord shows compassion to the faithful. For the Lord knows our frame and remember who we are. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon the faithful, and the righteousness to the Lord, to the children's children. Amen. Amen. Friends, go in peace. <laughs>